As a psalm, the key thing you need to learn is it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. Um, and, you know, there, after those three rules are learned, then you can move on. What I enjoy more than anything else is just giving people something that they like. It comes down to that, is it good or not? Not me telling you it's good, but do you like it? Yeah, I do. Great. Then we're having a good time. Let's move on. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The evolution of Queensland's food culture has been inspiring over the last decade or so. But often when we think of the restaurants carving a new path, we usually think of the food and the creative flair of the kitchen. But great hospitality is the sum of many parts. And there are a swag of front of house professionals who have not only left their mark on Queensland's restaurant scene, but helped shape and develop it over decades. Peter Marchant is the wine guy of Market Bistro and Wine Store in Maroochydore, Queensland. Peter, how are you going? Huck, I'm great. How are you? I'm great too, and it's good to have you on Deep in the Weeds. Very much looking forward to hearing um, all of your stories. To list all of the venues that you've been part of would probably take a five-part series. <laughs> <laughs> but as, as someone who has lived and breathed the evolution of the culinary landscape in Queensland, what's it been like the last 10 or 15 years? It's been um, it's been re- amazing to to see, um, I suppose that that evolution where it was um, certainly when I first started working in the industry a thousand years ago to to now is um, is quite dramatic. Um, you know, I remember some time ago now um, working in the city in in Brisbane and people would call um, from other states and say, "Where do we go on a Monday night?" And it's like um, Sydney. Uh, because there just was not a lot of places open. And I you know, fully understand that everyone needs some time off, but it was just one of those things where there just wasn't any sort of great venues to, that were open either at all or past sort of 8 p.m. And, and that is just such um, – that's a massive thing that's changed these days is just that time when things are open um, uh, and, what, and what they're doing. And, you know, I, I suppose I used to have a little list. I'd, I'd get emails or, or, or probably faxes back then, but no, they were emails. <laughs> <laughs> um, from people sort of saying, oh, you know, I'm coming to Brisbane, where should I go? And that list used to be quite short um, and we'd be like, well, we'll do this for that and this is the place to get the coffee and this is the place to get the, you know, the, the deli stuff and if you want this, then go there. And there was sort of probably only sort of a dozen venues on there um, and that's not having a go on anyone at all. It was just sort of really highlighting it. But now, you know, that's probably pages long. It's like, what are you, what are you looking for? You know, do you want modern Asian? Do you want Italian? Do you want great pizza? You know, what kind of pizza do you want? Um, and that's something that's been, you know, an absolute joy to sort of watch as well over those, you know, the last you know, sort of hundred years or so. You often hear people sort of talk of restaurants of like, oh, that's very Sydney, that restaurant, or that's very Melbourne. How would you describe, um, you know, the, what a what it's like to eat in Brisbane and what a what a Brisbane restaurant is? Yeah, it's it's almost uh, the scary thing was it was like the biggest compliment you could receive from someone in the old days was, oh, this is very Melbourne, isn't it? And it's like, uh, I don't know, as a, as a, you know, I'm a Brisbane boy um, and, you know, it was almost sort of slightly um, annoying, I suppose. It's like, well, who, who are we? Why are we trying to copy? And we don't need to copy. We're not those cities. And don't get me wrong, you know, I love Melbourne. I love Sydney. I've spent a lot of time in Melbourne. I lived there quite a lot for the last few years. But, you know, for me, um, Brisbane and Queensland has a different feel. Also, the thing for, you know, we often think about Queensland as one market. It's not. There's four very distinct markets and probably five if you go further west. You know, we've got far north Queensland, the Sunshine Coast, Brisbane and the Gold Coast, which are four very different places. And so venues in each of those places all have a very unique personality. You know, if you're sitting on the beach um, at rickshaws in, 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 in the Gold Coast, that's one thing that can't be replicated somewhere else because of where it is. And I think that that's, it's almost something, you know, from a, you know, if you go back, you know, to the development of Brisbane and the dining in Brisbane, where a lot of the things that we're challenged with in Brisbane and have been for many years was architecture and, you know, a lot of heritage buildings in the city. But a lot of those buildings weren't really designed for Brisbane necessarily. They were just of the time. And so you've got these big old clunky buildings that don't really make sense. Um, and, 
you know, when you go to, you know, the Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast and Far North Queensland, you see these venues that are on the beach and they're open and they're amazing. That's what it should be about. And I think that, you know, there has been a limitation of what you can and can't do in Brisbane based on buildings and also people's ability to sort of think outside the box. Um, we've also had so many licensing requirements and challenges that uh, that is a five-part series on its, on its own. Um <laughs> that have meant that like, we, we, didn't, we didn't have a small bar license until about 10 years ago, which is just insane. So, and when they first started, you could only have 100 people in, in the venue. I think I might have started at 60, actually. And then they increased it. I had a, a client of mine who had one of the first small bar licenses in Queensland and um, they got pinged for having 61 people in the venue once. And it's like, come on, seriously, there's got to be a better way to spend your time. So, but because of those sort of regulations, it meant, it meant that, businesses couldn't develop in certain ways. I mean, we still have, you know, archaic laws around licensing for bottle shops. You cannot open a bottle shop in Queensland without a pub. Simple as that. You have to have a full commercial hotel license that is then allowed to have an an on-premise, sorry, an off-premise facility and then three bottle shops, 10 kilometres as the crow flies from that facility. And that process, which is one that we've just been through at market, is exhausting um, and expensive and very challenging because what we've done is we don't play, we haven't played by the rules um, in terms of we don't fit the box as a pub, but that's the license we have to get. So there's a lot of development in the industry that have that's had to be, it's, it's been shaped by certain things. So yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's been, um, it, it's been really interesting to see the, the, the personality of Brisbane develop and, and in terms of what that dining means. And we know, you know, the Brown Snake, the Brisbane River has such an influence on Brisbane um, and those venues that are near the river, um, you know, are capitalising on that. You know, Howard Smith Wharves is a great example of those of that, you know, with the, the, those, you know, some amazing restaurants down there and um, sitting on the river. But it's also those places, you know, like the little bars like Super Whatnot in Burnett Lane, like, um, you know, the Gerards of the world that aren't, you you know, aren't really necessarily in the greatest places. Honto, there's heaps of places you go. Like, normally, you're like, what is this doing here? And I think really for me, when someone says, oh, it, this is kind of like Melbourne or Sydney, it's actually better than that. It's actually, you could be anywhere on the planet because it's not necessarily on the on the brown snake. So, you know, when it, when you take away the outside, it's like it's just a great venue Then and people don't know really know. They don't necessarily remember where they are. That's great. I want to talk about uh, the restaurants that you've worked in and, and the influence they've had on the culinary landscape a little later, but take us way back to when you were really young and, and when food became an interest for you. Yeah, I suppose, um, you know, for my mother was very heavily involved in food. She was a, um, a, an amazing uh, cook. Um, she was a cake decorator. She used to do a lot of um, cake decorating um, for weddings and for, you know, 40th birthdays and 50th birthdays and that kind of thing. And that morphed into a catering business, um, which she had and in the 80s. She um, started a business called Kids Kitchen, which was basically catering for kids' birthday parties. And so there was always this amazing food in our house, um, which was incredible, but it wasn't for us, um, which was sort of slightly frustrating. We, I remember we sort of – we had a downstairs area, which at one point in time had this bank of freezers. And mum would make – you know, she'd spend all week making, you know, this spinach and feta um, – you know, phyllos, pastries, or, you know, lamb and pine nut delicious things. And they weren't, we weren't allowed to eat them. They were for someone else. And it was like, I just sort of couldn't comprehend that as a child. And I would generally end up stealing them a little bit. Um, and, you know, we get some off cuts from now and then. Um, but I always give my mother grief for, for making us eat curried sausages while these people are eating, you know, fantastic um, pastry and all these little amazing canapes she used to do. So I suppose it, it started then. It definitely, it definitely did. And, um, you know, I was always, you know, probably just hanging around and, and eating the off cuts. And then um, as a sort of early teenager, I started cooking a bit for um, my mother would work and I would, um, my sister and I would generally be responsible for putting dinner together. And so we sort of started, you know, and it was pretty basic, don't get me wrong. I don't think mum would come home and go, thanks so much, this is incredible. She'd probably be like, oh, well, that'll do. Um, but I really enjoyed that. I loved cooking. Um, and uh, it was never something that I thought I would be um, where I would head um, from a career perspective. I mean, I wanted to be a, 
a doctor or an astronaut, you know, as a, as a young child and then worked out that you needed brains for both of those things. So um, very quickly worked out that wasn't for me. Um, and then I got my first job when I was 12 in a fish and chip shop with a mate's family. Um, and that was, that was cool. That was amazing. That was really hard work. Um, really, really hard work. They were tough. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot. Um, from them um, and yeah, I just sort of kept going I, you know worked at, worked all the way through school in different jobs um, and then the first restaurant when I was I think 16 and that's kind of where it was sort of I found my people you know people talk about you know finding your tribe or your village whatever it was all of a sudden I was like oh this is fun um, and you know probably for all the wrong reasons maybe at that time as well but you know, the misfits all banding together and, you know, um, doing things they probably shouldn't and, you know, drinking and smoking and all the cool things that you did when you were young. And then, yeah, it just sort of went from there. I think what's fascinating about the early on with your career is that you were, you were running venues and had venues at a very early age before sort of joining the ranks of some pretty incredible uh, restaurants. What, what was it like being so young and sort of getting the tender for, for cafes and having to run those? Yeah, I think um, it was weird. I mean, we, uh, I was, you know, working with a, a friend of mine at the time and we just decided to have a crack. Um, and I'd been working in hospitality for a lot longer than what he had. Um, and this tender came up and he said, oh, do you want to have a go at this? And I was like, yeah, why not? Sure, whatever. Um, not thinking in any way, shape or form we would win it. And I don't, still to this day, don't really understand what QUT was thinking at the time, the Queensland University of Technology, giving basically a venue to a couple of 20-year-old kids, 21-year-old kids. Um, but thank God they did. Um, you know, we had so much fun in that business and, and learned so much and, you know, um, you know, that sort of started the roll on from there. And then because of the relationships we had there, we were asked to tender for another another venue, which at that time was, um, you know, kind of a big deal um, uh, at the powerhouse, which was a big redevelopment of the, the old Brisbane powerhouse um, in New Farm. And, you know, that's where, you know, it sort of started to, you know, just turn into something bigger than Ben Hur. Um, but yeah, I, I still don't understand to this day. I mean, I do the what the when we tended to what we opened at um, what modern dining at the powerhouse, that was a that was a lot of work that went into that. Um, and it was for it was for the city council, but there was a, a the people that were making the decisions were very theatrical. They were very arty. And so we played up on that. I mean, you know, we we presented the tender in a um, you know, metal briefcase with a ransom note and you know just just being idiots we were like what have we got to lose and something obviously worked i mean there were solid financials behind it all and we'd done all the work as well but there was that other sort of extra sort of you know that i think you know people talk about it a bit that one plus one equals three kind of thing that happened that really really just made sense to them for some reason restaurant two is a, a restaurant that had a massive impact on Brisbane's uh, culinary landscape and, and you rose the ranks to end up being a co-owner of that and uh, three. What, tell us about that period of time. What was it like being part of that incredible restaurant? Yeah, look, it, it, it's one of those things where um, I, I suppose at the time, and I think a lot of people, when you're working in restaurants like that, you don't think you're doing a great job. I mean, it's, which is just, you know, Looking back, we worked hard, really hard, and that business was incredible. And you know, it was the it was the the restaurant where people went to either get married or make a deal or celebrate a deal or whatever it was. And you know, we had a five hundred bin wine list, which was big for for Brisbane at that time. It was quite big, and it was just constantly evolving. And you know, I got to open and 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 serve some some of the world's great wines. We had amazingly um, generous clients that would bring wines in and go, oh, you need to taste these, Peter. You know, you need to taste these 82 Bordeaux again. You know, it's just like, what? Like the first growths, you know, and that, that kind of thing. And those that generosity is really, for me, where it was like, okay, I am now getting to taste things that I shouldn't taste. I, I can't afford these things. Um, uh, they should, you know, be going to people who have better knowledge than I do and a, bi a bigger wallet. But um, the privilege of sort of serving and tasting these wines was just awesome. Um, but that restaurant, you know, we won so many awards and it was one of those things where we'd win an award and we wouldn't really necessarily celebrate it so much. We'd be like, right, what can we do better? You know, we were never really satisfied, I suppose, um, which is, 
I don't know. It's, I think it's part of that hospitality perfectionism that can really break people as well because it's not fair because you are actually doing an okay job. Um, and I think back then, you know, we're talking about the Amex Awards that no longer exist and, you know, the, the plates and all this kind of stuff and the, the um, before hats even existed, you know, and there was all of these, all of these things that we sort of managed to get that were really cool. And we had a great team. It wasn't a big team, but it was a really great team of professionals. You know, I remember at one stage, I think we used to write the roster with basically six or seven full-time floor staff and that was it. Um, and it just meant such a difference to the business because everyone was there all the time. Everyone, you could sort of, you know, nod or wink or, you know, make a symbol. You know, we used to have all these symbols for coffees because the place is a cavern. It's 400 square metres long. So the bar to the dining platform at that point in time was so long. If you cut it down by signalling to, you know, on your, on your ring finger that you wanted a, a gold. You know, so if you think you tapped your ring finger, that meant gold. You had a, a flat white symbol, you know, you touched your apron, that was a long black. So you could talk to the, the bar from that far away because we didn't have all these fancy point of sales now that, you know, you can <laughs> put put something in and then it prints somewhere else. What are you talking about? It was triplicate dockets and it was, you know, a, a till that you press buttons on and, you know, it was – it was just, it was a really cool time, I suppose. But that was a, it was a great restaurant. And, you know, I suppose the other thing that I learned at that point in time, I mean, David Pugh was a chef, was an incredible human being and the food that he was producing was just next level. And some of the people we had through that restaurant and that kitchen, you know, are just have gone on to, you know, amazing. Ben Devlin was there, you know, from Pippet. And I just remember Ben working in the kitchen and just going, I, I remember, I, I, I vividly remember going, this guy's a machine. Like he's a, uh, there's a next next level kind of human being here. And, you know, from then he went, you know, to, to Denmark and then, you know, um, you know, came back and it was like, wow, okay, yeah, right. It all sort of makes sense. And, you know, I love what Ben's done. So that's been really cool to sort of see where people have ended up as well from that restaurant. And personally people have worked with Dave have generally done pretty well. But yeah, it was a, it was a phenomenal business. I actually had dinner um, at Walters, which is where two was last week. It's the first time I've been back into the venue since it's been anything else, and um, it was super weird uh, to be sitting in the in the same space. And it's very different, obviously. Um, Andrew's done a great job with the fit out at Walters, and uh, you know, well, I had a great meal there. But it was so weird, and I sort of came home the whole time. Was like that was just a really weird experience because. I spent seven or eight years of my life in that place, um, which for a restaurant life is like dog years. It was probably 50, you know, um, and sitting in there with a different fit out, different food, but knowing, you know, the bathrooms are still there. The kitchen's still there. That's where the bar used to be. And, you know, the amount of things that happen in that place. I mean, God, we know a lot of people talk about writing books about hospitality. You know, um, I, you know, God, I, I, yeah, I, the, the things that actually happened within those walls will, should never be spoken of again to a certain degree. So. You're, uh, you've won many accolades and one of the country's most influential sommeliers. When did it all sort of click for you in regards to food and wine? And from your perspective, what makes a great wine experience? Um, I think, you know, I know, you know, I've been listening to this podcast from the start and a lot of people in similar roles have talked about that idea. It's about um, people, but but Dan Sims, who you know I used to work with for many years, um, one of the key things that sommeliers, and certainly from my perspective, that I learned really young. Um, I think a lot of people, probably every now and then, there's a few people that probably need to hear this as well. Um, as a som, the key thing you need to learn is it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. Um, and, you know, there after those three rules are learnt, then you can move on. Um, and, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, I, for me, I'm classically, you know, that's how I, I cut my teeth, selling classic wine, tasting classic wine. And, um, you know, I think that that's kind of my, not default position, but it probably is. And I love the development in, in wine and going back to these old school styles and, and whatever it may be. Um, but what, what I enjoy more than anything else is just giving people something that they like. Um, and it comes down to that, is it good or not? Not me telling you it's good, but do you like it? Yeah, I do. Great. Then we're having a good time. Let's move on. 
you know, um, and that idea of I'm just there to facilitate their experience. That's it. Wine is experiential. Again, everyone said this before, but it is. It's always about the people, the place, the time, the mood, all of that kind of stuff. The booze is just part of that, um, you know, and I think that, you know, we sometimes get carried away in how important wine is. Um, and it is it is important in terms of the big picture of dining and entertaining, whatever it may be, but it's not the be-all and end-all. Um, you know, we're not curing diseases here. Um, we're just making sure people are having a good time. And that's the key thing for me. And it doesn't matter if you want to spend $9 or you want to spend $9,000. You know, there is something for you um, at every at every level. And I enjoy more than anything else is giving people value, you know. So they're in there and, you know, they might come in and go, oh, I only want to spend 100 bucks. Like, you don't need to. You know, let's, what do you, what do you like? You know, that's the first question. What do you like? You know, oh, I like Sav Blanc. All right, we'll drink Sav Blanc. You know, most songs be like, well, you can't drink that. You know, <laughs> God, it's a weed. You know, um, you know, I, I love the fact that every song in the country, most probably, and I love everyone, hi. Um, but, <laughs> you know, someone will say Sauvignon Blanc and everyone will roll their eyes. It's like it's paid our wages for the last 15 years. Shut up. You know, it's a gateway drug. It gets people into wine. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, it pays the wages. And there's nothing wrong with people drinking Sauvignon Blanc. You know, and someone say, oh, I'll drink Sauvignon Blanc, but it's only going to be Silex or it's going to be whatever. And it's like, come on, you know, you don't have to drink it. But, you know, a lot of people love it. So, you know, it's it's also that. And, you know, that idea of as a song, you've only got a certain amount of time in, with a guest. So, if you think you need to swim upstream and educate them, you're doing the wrong thing. Just give them what they want and move on to the next table. Um, and I think that a lot of songs, you know, and not, not these days as much, but certainly in the past, it was like, oh, let me show you the weirdest and most wonderful thing made by nuns in a bathtub in northern Italy. <laughs> and it's like, I just want a Pinot Gris, mate. You know, just why? Why are we, why are we doing this? You know, um, and I think that God, I remember years ago, digressing back to Sauvignon Blanc again, but um, I was on a trip, Junket, let's we'll call it what it is, um, to, in Victoria, and there was a song there from Sydney, and she was going on about how she didn't have any New World Sauvignon Blancs on her wine list, and she was on the harbour in a big restaurant in Sydney. And I was like, why? She said, oh, I don't believe in it. It's like, it's not a unicorn. Like, it exists. It's a thing. Just take the money. She's like, no, no, I'll sell Sancerre. It's like, yeah, they're cool. That's great. Like, good on you. But how many times a day is someone asking you for Sauvignon Blanc? And she's like, oh, probably 20. I'm like, I don't have that time. I don't have 20 minutes in a day in service to, to spend explaining to someone what Sauvignon Blanc is from the Loire Valley. Uh, as opposed to here's here's a bottle of whatever here's the eighty bucks great we're on next table I'm gonna go now so now I'm gonna go sell Chablis to this person so that stuff just blows my mind so you've been uh, involved consulting to venues all over the country uh, what's it like translating that ethos in such different venues yeah look that's probably the biggest challenge I suppose for what I when I when I was doing that was that idea of the wine lists aren't mine. Um, they're the venues and that's really critical I think again it's probably that thing that some often get excited when they get control of a list and they sort of stamp their personality all over it um, and then you know inevitably something changes and all of a sudden a venue's stuck with 45 shit Chenin Blancs that no one knows what to do with so um, for me a great wine list is one that sells um, it's not just about looking pretty or being big or being small or anything else you know it's working within the constraints of each business that I used to work with and that's generally budgetary constraints more than anything else else and trying to provide them with all of the things that make sense, you know, ease of ordering, um, you know, so it might be limited suppliers or they want certainly inter interesting things, whatever it may be. But for me, it's always about the personality of the venue and trying to maintain that through the wine list. Um, and we often see that I often see, and you know, there's a disconnect between walking the walk and talking the talk when it comes to certain things. One of the big ones for me at the moment um, or in the last few years that I've really noticed is that idea of people talking about local produce and, you know, so you'll go to a venue and it's all about we only get everything from within 500 kilometres and we know everyone's by name and everything else. And you're like, okay, cool. And you grab the wine list and, again, it's got the most quirky, obscure grape variety from Sardinia on there. And it's like, yeah, okay. It's sort of half the half the battle. It's like okay, so you you're happy to walk and get your yabbies, but you're also happy to pay for you know twelve bottles of glass to be delivered from you know Sardinia. 
you know, what's the cost in that from a carbon perspective, if that's what we're talking about. So I see, I see there's still a very big disconnect in this country with that concept. And I'm not having to go at any imported wines, don't get me wrong, um, or producers from any particular region or suppliers or whatever it may be. It's just, I think that there's, you know, and I've certainly had a couple of lists that I've looked after in the last few years where we've really pushed towards looking after local, more Australia. Um, and the response has been very positive. Um, you're always going to get someone's going to push back. Like at the moment at market in the, in the wine store, on the floor, I only have Australia and New Zealand and champagne because champagne, um, but that's it. So if, you know, we don't carry any imports on the floor, um, it's just a, um, something that I decided I wanted to do and see how it goes. And the response has been really positive. I think now more than ever, people are very much happy to support people, um, people locally. With your experience all over the country, do, do they – drink differently in Queensland? A wine is, <laughs> it, well, is it diffi- more difficult to cater to because climate's so different compared to, say, Victoria? Yeah, there's about three weeks of the year where we drink red wine, um, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a joke, but that's not the case at all. And I can, you know, the, I, I, I know the, the numbers don't say that, but that is generally the, the thought from most people in southern states, I think, or was anyway. But um, look, the climate does have an impact. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I remember at two, we used to have this is, you know, again, a thousand years ago, we had five rosés on the list of 500. And I think we sold one in about two years. Um, now, I mean, we're selling, you know, cases of rosé every week um, in the bistro um, by the glass because it's just what people want to drink. And so there's that, there's a combination of things. I think it's also, there's a fashion thing that comes with that as well. And, you know, um, but it's definitely climate. Um, we tend to drink you know, a lot of white wine, pure and simple, light, aromatic whites. Again, our good friend Sauvignon Blanc, Green Grigio, definitely. Chardonnay is still a big boy, though. There's still a lot of people looking for that old school style of Chardonnay. It's like, oh, what's, which one's the most buttery? And it's like, you know, they're there, which is great. But I think a lot of producers in this country have pushed the other way and going for that sort of leaner, more sort of new school Australian Chardonnay where it's more about precision and, 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 and energy rather than just power and weight. But there's people out there that still want to drink those things. Um, I think that, you know, there's been some great venues in Queensland that have certainly pushed the envelope in terms of showing people new styles of wine um, as well. And there's more coming, you know, um, in Brisbane, the openings are quite phenomenal at the moment, which is awesome. Um, but I think that there's still a fairly traditional market. And again, with, with what part of Queensland we're talking about, I don't like tarring the whole state with one brush because that's not the case. Um, I know that, you know, as a general rule, the, the sales of varieties would be fairly similar um, across across Queensland. But, um, you know, there's, there is a big difference between sitting, you know, what a restaurant in Cairns is going to sell compared to a restaurant in Ipswich um, uh, on a number of levels. But it's, it's for me, the, the, the aromatic whites are definitely still a massive part of the market. And I think if, if people are avoiding that and only giving people, you know, again, wines made in bathtubs on skins, then they're probably going to miss the boat. You mentioned Dan Sims a little earlier and that you'd worked uh, for many years with him with uh, events like Pinot Palooza and Game of Thrones and, and many others. Uh, Tell us about that space and what it takes to create a successful uh, wine event. A lot of work, a lot, a lot of work. It's um, yeah. It was look. It was it, it was intense. Those things because it was basically a, you know a circus in terms of it. we travelled and you know I mean I used to hit over a hundred flights every year for about four years, um, which has its own sort of issues, but those events are exhausting in the preparation, but then the execution is something that um, is quite phenomenal. You run on pure adrenaline for 24, 48 hours um, just to get them done because there's so many stakeholders. You've got the in the uh, exhibitors, the, the wineries in particular. Pinot Palooza is a great example. So in Melbourne, you know, we had – the last Palooza I did there, we had something like 85 producers, um, all of who are there for different reasons as well. And that's the key thing. It's understanding why they're there. Some of them are there to sell booze. Some of them just want to have a party. Some of them just want to market. You know, there's all different reasons for them being there. So it's trying to understand all of those reasons and make sure we, we're, we're doing that for them. They've all got different requirements. You know, the, the boring shit, for lack of a better phrase, that I used to get involved in. In, you know, in terms of toilets and power. And, you know, I, I'm now a certified tag and tester. So if anyone needs their toaster tagged and tested, I can do it. Not in Queensland, irony. Do the training here. Can't do it in Queensland. Um, but, you know, I, I went and did that because we would have 20 food producers coming to Pinot Palooza in Melbourne and, you know, you give them 
six months' notice, you better have everything tagged and tested, otherwise you can't plug it in the venue. You arrive on the day and they're like, oh, I can't plug it in. It's like, yeah, no kidding. Um, so the logistical side of things, moving 5,000 glass glass, where glasses around the country, moving all of our just – stuff um you know we used to have the the suitcase of love which ended up being the suitcase of death because it was so heavy and just had so much shit in it that no one knew you know and it's just like where is things you know where are the lanyards where are the this that kind of stuff it's just there's so many moving parts to it um you know it was it was exhausting um and we had a you know we had a great team and everyone did did amazing things um and they were you know those those events were, were something special and i really hope for dan's sake that they they do get back to where they were um but you know it's um i think that the you know i i was called you know the head of experience um for a while there and i think my main job was to do all of the stuff that no one else wanted to do so you know security um you know rsa dear lord um don't get me started uh um you know there's so many of those boring things you just have to do that aren't you know important not sorry aren't no they are important i suppose if you're uh, yeah you know what i mean like there's just this stuff that's just like so time consuming that you don't actually get anything get anything for um you know it's just yeah it's just it it's exhausting but there is nothing like the feeling at the end of an event the greatest feeling at the end of the event for me was the shower Getting clean after being on your feet for 18 hours you know we we did weekends we'd walk you know 100 kilometers in a weekend i mean because i would just be basically permanently doing laps like a shark just trying to work out what the next problem is i had to put out a fire on and um you know you're exhausted your feet you can't feel your feet you can't generally feel and (laughs) that's one of the things for me as i got older it used to be my ankles that hurt then it became my knees and then all of a sudden it was my hips i'm like wow i'm in trouble now so um you know i think that it's it's one of those things where the older you get, the more you realise you just punish your body, um, and your body would hate you. We used to have what we call PED, which is post event depression, the day after an event or the second day after an event, where it's this come down after this adrenaline, the physical exhaustion, the fact that you've probably spoken to a million people over the weekend, and all you want to do is crawl up in a ball and just you know probably binge watch something and eat ice cream. And it it, it was that we did that fifty times a year. You know, it was frightening, um, and but that's what we did. So yeah, it, look, it was it was really amazing, and they, you know, those events. As I said, I really hope they do come back. You, you've uh, consulted to so many restaurants to help them with their wine program across the country. What's been your favourite experience? <laughs> oh, that's probably hard to drill it down into one one experience. I mean, I think. There's, there's sort of key moments in, in a lot of the businesses where you're like, cool, that's awesome. I mean, I remember it at Esquire, you know, when, you know, it was the only three-hat restaurant in Queensland. The wine list was remarkably small um, and probably was the thing that held that venue back, I suppose, a little bit. But, um, you know, that was, again, the constraints that, you know, were put on me by by Ryan and, and, and Cam at the time. It's like we've only got this to play with. And so it was just trying to, trying to write something decent with – bugger all dollars and you know you didn't want to hold stock and um that's challenging um, i think probably the overall thing for me whilst i was doing that was those light bulb moments for staff when i used to do a lot of training in venues as part of what i did and you get that you say you have six people or eight people um wait staff or floor staff or wine team around a table and you're tasting wines you're talking to them about wines and for me i always talk about people in place i very rarely will tell someone that it smells like blueberries or juniper or whatever because i don't care it's more about the people in the place and it's not my job to tell you what what something smells or tastes like you have your own olfactory system to do that um but that light bulb moment when they taste something and maybe a descriptor is thrown out there and they just go bang you know yes i get it um that's that's so rewarding um and the same thing from a customer perspective when you're in these venues and you know you give them someone a wine and they just go yes that's exactly what i want and you just know that that's made their experience better which is what our job is to do you know so they're the things i mean i work with some i've worked with some great people as well and been really fortunate to 
to sort of be the custodian of some pretty great wine lists and take them, you know, in certain directions, which is which is pretty cool. And you know, working with spices was such a great a great thing as well because I had free reign in seven and then eight and then nine venues to to do whatever I wanted in very different venues. So that was that was really challenging but great. And again, the teams and at one point in time, I was in every venue once a month doing training and you know just seeing their people's knowledge develop and people get the bug. I suppose, and when they get that hook for wine, and you know straight away, you're like, "And you're done. Ha! Ah, see you in twenty years," because you just, I love that. I love seeing them get into it, um, and knowing that, you know, you've had something to do with that is pretty cool. Um, but I think, yeah, it, again, it's that idea. It's the people. It always will be the people. The second that it stops being about this industry, stops being about the people, we're screwed. It doesn't matter if it's the customers or the staff or anything else. And I think that some of the things that have happened in the last sort of 12 or 18 months are pushing back onto that. It is more about the people, particularly staff, you know, looking after people and making sure that time off happens and overtime gets paid and all of those things. I think that's that's critical. But, you know, um, there's I remember Pinot 2017, the conference. I love it's how it's called a Pinot conference, but it's, you know, we all know what generally goes on, but it is. It's an amazing thing that happens in New Zealand every sort of four years and we can't wait to get back there and do it again. But um, the whole idea, concept around that was um, a, a Maori concept called Turanga Waiwai, which is basically the place where your feet is at home. And I remember the opening um, of that conference, there was a video that was shot and there was a, a, a Maori gentleman who, you know, said at the end of the day, it all comes down to the people, the people, the people. And I think that's something that our industry has to remember at all times. It's not about the awards. It's not about the ratings. It's not about the glasses. They're all great. But, you know, if you've got an amazing business, but you're a jerk to your staff, then you're still a jerk. If you've got um, amazing staff and you're a jerk to your customers, you're still a jerk. So, you know, the people are everything. You've had some interesting titles in your career, head of experience, and you're now the wine guy at Market Bistro. T- tell us about Market Bistro. So Market's a, a new business in the new Maruchidor CBD. So it's a purpose-built CBD um, that's built on an old golf club um, just um, south of the um, big shopping centre here on the Sunshine Coast, the plaza. A um, few people have been pretty upset and come in to buy wine at the store and they're like, this is my old golf course. And so, sorry, mate. But, um, you know, there's a this development is, is really amazing. There's a new city hall coming in, which has got 3,000 people coming into it. We've got a Holiday Inn. Yeah, Holiday Inn coming in next to us as well. At the moment, we're a, a, a seven-story building. We're at the bottom of that building. We've got our sister restaurant next door called Giddy Geisha. Um, and we are uh, it. Around us is basically high-vis and people building things. So it's a it's a bit of a challenge and will be for the next 12 months. But we knew that from the start. And um, Tony Kelly, who owns Rice Boy and Sparrow in Mooloolaba, um, we've been mates for a long time. And um, when sort of uh, I was um, I took a redundancy last year and um, came moved down to the coast from um, living up in Mullaney, and TK and I just caught up for lunch and you know he sort of said oh, I've got this idea and you know started you know I was like oh hey, hello here we go and it was one of those things where straight away I was like oh that sounds really interesting and I think you know um, for me you know I've done a few things but it's like I. I I like the idea of a challenge. I've never done retail before. Um, and so we sort of thought, well, why don't we have a crack at this and do it in a way that hasn't been done before? You know, uh, um, on the, the Sunshine Coast is so dominated by the large um, chains of, of bottle shops um, based on the um, challenges we have with licensing. So there's basically only really one other independent bottle store on the Sunshine Coast, which is in Noosa, and they've got two shops up there, and they do an amazing job, but nothing at the southern end. And so we thought, well, maybe there's an opportunity here. And, um, you know, so we're, we're very much sort of trying something new. The bistro is epic. We've got an amazing chef, Harry um, Lillay, who was in uh, Chaconis in Melbourne for many, many years and such a good cook. And he's got a great team with him. And, you know, we're busy. I, I, I 
I've sort of lost track of how many venues I've been involved with from opens, but I've never seen this before in terms of the voraciousness of guests. The, 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 the locust mentality is in, and I think that's a combination of things. But, you know, where we are certainly doesn't have much to do with it because we're literally in the middle of a building site. But, um, you know, Sunshine Coast is such an amazing place to live, you know, um, as – can be attested to the, the the property prices and rental prices at the moment where everyone's coming up from other states to to move to now that everyone can work from home and um you know this this business is something that is is really cool you know it's that really classic sort of bistro food harry's pasta he's got an italian background his pasta is incredible um but yeah it's been a it's been a, a pretty steep learning curve based on the on the um how busy we are but there's still a long way to go from a wine perspective you know we've still got a, the wine the the, the online store is still coming the website's still coming all of that kind of stuff but you know we're we're playing with some pretty fun booze um you know um we're we're selling some some great wine there's some you know, people. I know everyone's talked about this in the past, and at the moment, every you know the the money that's being spent in Australia right now is just incredible. Um, you know, and it's great to see. And so, I think the opportunity to open in the middle of what was probably the weirdest year of everyone's life last year was one of those things where it's like it doesn't make sense, but it kind of does. And you know, we're really fortunate that with the team that we've got, you know, Luke Stringer's running um, front of house, and you know, one of the owners here, and he's, you know, um, you know, again, you know, there's so much. Um, history there and so much experience um between between the team um and you know tk is just a a great business mind that's got so much going on the coast and so much history here on the coast that he's got a a bit of a following um you know to the point we first put on the the new menu menu it was a there's a truffle soup that he used to do um at the wine bar here many 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 years ago and you know the amount that that sold it's a soup for god's sake i was like who's eating soup in the middle of summer in queensland but the answer is a lot of people so you know that's that's testament to him and the work that he's done here and and understanding the market so yeah it's a really it's a really interesting business and again we're sort of just hitting sort of phase one there's there's more to come which is going to be great well peter um We've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds and and uh, thank you for what you've gifted uh, Queensland in regards to hospitality and all of the venues that you've been part of and and part of in the future as well. Um, I think we could probably catch up and, and pray, maybe try and do that five-part series again down the track. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to it and thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's been great to listen to the stories um, over the last year or so and it's an absolute privilege to be to be on here. Awesome, mate. Keep in touch and um, we'll talk again soon. Talk soon. Thanks, Huck. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.